It is pleasant when justice catches up with bad people the corrupt, the criminal, and the otherwise horrid, and they get what is coming to them, unfortunately, and more often than not, justice has a far easier time catching up with the small fry bad folk than it does when it comes to the powerful, the rich and the connected baddies. Too often, the mighty get away with it, leaving the rest of us to gnash our teeth and hope that there's another tribunal in the afterlife where they'll pay for what they got away with in this life sometimes. However, justice, vengeance, or karma do catch up with the powerful in this life, following our 20 things about times when powerful bad people ended up paying for it. Number 20. Most perpetrators of the Armenian Genocide escaped punishment, but not all. During World War I, the Ottoman Turk authorities sought to end to the restiveness of their oppressed Armenian citizens by putting an end to the Armenians via genocide, under the guise of relocating them from border regions to the interior of their empire. The Ottomans subjected the Armenians to massacres and death marches, interrupted by widespread and horrendous abuses, that claimed the lives of 1 to 1.5 million victims. Following Turkey's defeat and surrender at war's end, desultory efforts were made to bring those responsible to account. However, no international tribunal existed to try the criminals, and their prosecution in Turkish courts eventually petered out due to domestic political pressures. As a result, those who had orchestrated the genocide escaped formal justice and were able to travel relatively freely throughout much of Europe and Central Asia, that is until the Armenians decided to bring them to account, vigilante style. Number 19. Operation Nemesis At the end of World War I, an Ottoman military tribunal sentenced the principal leaders, responsible for planning the Armenian genocide to death, however the condemned were freed at the end of the trial, and fled to Europe where they lived under assumed names, disgusted at such a miscarriage of justice. Some members of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, a nationalist party decided to take matters into their own hands, and bring the guilty to account. A secret ARF resolution called the Special Mission was passed to punish the main perpetrators of the genocide. The result was Operation Nemesis, named after the ancient Greek goddess of divine retribution. Between 1920 to 1922, Armenian Avengers stalked those responsible for the genocide throughout Europe and Asia to deal them lethal justice. Number 18. The First Sacrifice to Nemesis The first target claimed by the Avengers of Operation Nemesis was the first Prime Minister of Independent Azerbaijan, Fatali Khan Khoisky. He was accused of having played a prominent role in the massacre of tens of thousands of Armenians in Baku in 1918. Azerbaijan's independence did not last for long, and the Bolsheviks overran and incorporated it into the Soviet Union in 1920. That April, Khoisky fled to Tiflis, Georgia to escape the advancing Red Army. On June 19, Armenian revolutionary Aram Yurganian opened fire on Khoisky in Tiflis Yerevan Square killing him on the spot. Number 17. Landing a Big Fish Next to fall to Operation Nemesis was Mehmed Talat Pasha, one of a triumvirate known as the Three Pashas, who had ruled the Ottoman Empire during World War I. Talat had initiated the Armenian Genocide in 1915, while serving as Minister of Interior Affairs. He fled the Ottoman Empire in early November of 1918, aboard a German submarine and settled in Berlin. He was tried in absentia by a Turkish court-martial, and sentenced to death, however the Turks were not that eager to have him extradited, and the Germans denied knowledge of his whereabouts, in reality, Talat's presence in Germany was a semi-open secret, and he traveled throughout much of Central Europe and Scandinavia without hindrance. That state of affairs lasted until 1921, when Operation Nemesis caught up with him. Number 16. Death on a Berlin Street Talat Pasha's impunity ended in 1921, an Armenian revolutionary named Sogholm and Thlerian, had discovered Talat's Berlin address, and rented an apartment nearby to study his every move. On March 15, 1921, Thlerian shadowed Talat when he left his house. Upon confirming his target's identity Thlerian pulled out a Luger pistol, shot Talat dead in broad daylight and waited over the corpse for the police to arrive and arrest him. Thlerian's subsequent trial for murder was a sensation, which he used as a platform to draw attention to the Armenian genocide, his lawyers focused on the impact the genocide had on Thlerian's mental state, and he testified that he had acted after his mother, killed during the atrocity had appeared to him in a dream, berating him for not having avenged her, it took a Berlin jury one hour to acquit him, returning a verdict of not guilty on grounds of temporary insanity. Number 15. The vilest of murderers Gamal Azmi, known as the Butcher of Trebizond, 
might have been the most abhorrent of Operation Nemesis targets, a founder of the Tescalot I Ma Susa, special organization, a unit created to suppress dissent and separatism in the Ottoman Empire, Azmi was serving as governor of Trebizond province. When the Armenian genocide commenced in 1915, an enthusiastic participant, he massacred Armenians by the tens of thousands. Azmi was particularly vicious towards Armenian children and women, and had thousands of them drowned in the Black Sea. Witnesses testified that he had turned a local hospital into a pleasure dome, where he indulged in sexual orgies with young Armenian girls, before murdering them, reminiscing about it. Azmi told an acquaintance, among the most pretty Armenian girls, 10 to 13 years old, I selected a number of them and handed them to my son as a gift, the others I had drowned in the sea. Number 14. Justice on the Ulenstrasse After the war, Jamal Azmi fled to Germany, and the organizers of Operation Nemesis eventually tracked him down in Berlin, Aram Yurganian, who had already killed one of the retribution campaign's targets, was tasked with bringing down Azmi, plus another genocide accomplice. A Dr. Behadin Shakir, partnering with Yurganian was another Armenian revolutionary, Arshaver Shurakian. On April 17, 1922, Yurganian and Shurakian came upon Jamal Azmi and Behadin Shakir as the two murderers were strolling, with their families on Berlin's Ullenstrasse. Shurakian opened fire killing Azmi, but only wounding Behadin, who took off running, Yurganian took off after the fleeing genocideer, caught up with him, and finished him with a bullet to the head. Neither shooter was apprehended. Number 13. Operation Nemesis Final Major Target Ahmed Jemal Pasha was another of the three Pashas who had ruled the Ottoman Empire during World War I, also known as al Safa or the Bloodshedder. Jemal Pasha was one of the key participants in the Armenian Genocide. After the war he fled to Germany, then to Switzerland. A Turkish court-martial sentenced him to death in absentia. In 1920, Jemal headed to Afghanistan, where he worked on modernizing its army, with the Bolshevik Revolution and the Russian Civil War roiling the neighboring USSR, he headed to Tiflis, Georgia to negotiate with the Soviets on behalf of Afghanistan. There are a trio of Armenian revolutionaries. Atrash's Javorgian, Stepan Zagajian, and Petros Taras Pagasyan assassinated Jemal Pasha and his secretary on July 21, 1922. He was the last major genocideer brought to account by Operation Nemesis. Number 12. Slumming with Pirates Criminals suck, they suck even more when they're rich folk who have need to go criming, but do so simply for kicks and giggles and as a way of slumming, few exemplify that better than Steed Bonnet, circa 1680-1718, a rich Barbados plantation owner and army major who turned to piracy for no rational reason. Born into a wealthy family of landed gentry, Bonnet had led a peaceful life for years, living with his wife in a profitable Barbadian sugar plantation, then, out of the blue in 1717, and some type of mid-life crisis, he decided to escape marital difficulties and boredom at home by purchasing a ship, naming it the Revenge and outfitting it with cannons. He hired a crew of 70 sailors, then sailed off into the deep blue to become a pirate. Number 11. The Gentleman Pirate Steve Bonnet was nicknamed the Gentleman Pirate, and swiftly gained fame or infamy, not because of his success as a pirate, but because of the astonishing incompetence he displayed, after taking up a career he had no business pursuing, as it turned out, he probably should have left piracy to roughnecks better suited to its travails and vicissitudes. As might be expected from a rich dilettante who became a pirate on a whim, Bonnet was not very good at it, he was soon exposed as an incompetent sailor and poor leader, and managed to capture only a few small and trifling prizes off the coasts of the Carolinas and Virginia, the only reason Bonnet's crew did not depose him and elect another in his stead to command the revenge was that he paid them regular and generous wages, the only pirate captain to do so. Number 10. The End of the Road at the End of a Noose Bonnet came across Blackbeard in Florida, who befriended and persuaded him, to give up command of the revenge because of his utter incompetence at piracy, Bonnet transferred to Blackbeard's Queen Anne's Revenge, where he remained as a guest, while his own ship. The revenge was taken over by one of Blackbeard's lieutenants. Soon thereafter, Bonnet accepted a royal pardon, but returned to piracy in July 1718. Hapless as ever, Bonnet thought that adopting the alias Captain Thomas and changing the name of his ship to Royal James would mask his identity. It did not. The following month, a British naval expedition came across Bonnet at anchor in the Cape Fear River estuary, and after a fight captured him and his crew, Bonnet escaped, but was recaptured after a few weeks on the lamb taken to Charleston there. He was tried, convicted, 
sentenced to death and hanged on December 10, 1718. Number 9. The Thief Catcher Who Was Also a Crime Boss 18th Century English Crime Boss Jonathan Wilde, 1682-1725, ruled an underground kingdom of thieves and highwaymen, ran a far-flung extortion rack, and was Britain's biggest fence for stolen goods, after he feigned reform. The authorities turned to Wilde, gave him the title thief-taker, and set him loose on the criminals running amok and terrorizing London. Wilde took to his new job and title with a passion, forming highly effective teams of thief-catchers who fell upon the criminals with a will, breaking up gangs and sending criminals to the gallows by the dozen. During his thief-catching career, at least 120 were executed based on Wilde's testimony and information he furnished the authorities, however far from having gone legit, Wilde had hoodwinked everybody, the thief-catcher became an even bigger criminal kingpin, ridding himself of competitors by delivering them to the authorities. Number 8. The thief-catcher gets caught. Jonathan Wilde also set up a side business as a private detective, recovering stolen goods for a fee, he failed to inform his clients that it was his thieves who had stolen their goods in the first place, and recovery simply amounted to Wilde sifting through his warehouses of stolen property. He was finally brought down, when a criminal double-crossed by Wilde accused him of fencing stolen goods, an investigation confirmed the accusation, and Wilde was arrested, that was when many of his underlings took the opportunity to turn crown evidence against him, until his whole scheme of simultaneously being England's greatest crime fighter, and greatest criminal came out, he was swiftly tried, convicted and hanged at Tyburn, where he had sent so many others to their doom. Number 7. The Viking Who Devastated Scotland Sigurd the Mighty, died 892, was a Viking Earl who ruled the Orkney and Shetland Islands off the northern coast of Scotland, allied with other Vikings chieftains. He launched an invasion of the Scottish mainland which devastated and conquered northern Scotland overran Sutherland and Caithness, and asserted Viking control as far south as Moray, Sigurd's exploits during that conquest earned him the epithet the mighty from fellow Vikings. He gained his earldom after the Viking king of a recently unified Norway sent Sigurd's brother, Ragnvald Steinsson to conquer the Shetland and Orkney Islands after they became a refuge for Norwegian exiles, from which they raided their homeland during the conquest. Ragnvald lost a son, so the king of Norway compensated him by giving him the islands, and making him earl, having interests elsewhere, Ragnvald gave the islands and the title to his younger brother Sigurd. Number 6. Cheating pays until it doesn't. Sigurd the mighty god is just deserts when, during the course of his conquest, and devastation of northern Scotland, he challenged a local chieftain, I'll break the bucktoothed, head of the kingdom of Moray to a forty-man per side battle, however, Sigurd cheated and showed up with eighty men outnumbered, the Scots were defeated and massacred, and Sigurd personally beheaded Myel Brigt. Tying the defeated leader's head to his saddle as a trophy, Sigurd rounded up his men and rode back home to celebrate the victory, however on the way back, as the severed head tied to the saddle bounced around, the bucktooth which gave Myel Brigt his nickname cut Sigurd's leg, the cut became inflamed and infected, and Sigurd died of the infection before he got back home. Number 5 Charles the Bad was well named. King Charles II of Navarre, also known as Charles the Bad, was a powerful French magnate with extensive holdings in Normandy and other parts of France. From 1349 he was also the King of Navarre, a small kingdom on the Pyrenees Mountains between France and Spain. Charles earned the nickname the Bad because of his propensity for intrigues, bad faith dealings, betrayals, dishonesty, and double crosses as he attempted to expand his kingdom at the expense of France and Spain. Number 4. Treason upon Treason Charles the Bad plotted with the English to betray his native France during the Hundred Years' War, and was arrested and locked up by the French King John II when his treachery came to light. Charles escaped from prison in 1357, and began a series of intrigues with a variety of French parties, betraying nearly all one after the other. After John II's death, his successor forced Charles to hand over most of his holdings in France. In 1378, Charles was forced to cede nearly all of his remaining French holding, when evidence of new treachery was discovered, proving that Charles not only planned to again betray France to the English, but plotted to go one better this time and poison the French king. Number 3. Charles the Bad's Badness Goes International To the south, Charles the Bad's poor reputation was no better in Spain, than it was in his native France, 
he allied with Peter the Cruel of Castile against Peter IV of Aragon in 1362, only to turn around and betray Castile the following year, by allying with Peter IV against Peter the Cruel. Crossing somebody whose epithet was the Cruel was risky, and in 1378, Castilian armies invaded Navarre, forcing Charles to flee post-haste, out of allies having betrayed them all. Charles was forced to agree to a humiliating treaty, that defanged his kingdom and reduced him and his realm to Castilian clients. Number 2. Karma finally catches up with Charles the Bad. Charles the Bad's karmic end came in 1387, when he came down with an illness that impeded the use of his limbs, a doctor prescribed that he be swaddled from head to foot in linen cloth, steeped in brandy or other spirits of wine. One of the palace maids, tasked with securing the swaddling cloth snugly, round the king's body by sewing it in place with yarn, realized when she was done that she had no scissors with which to snip the excess thread. Resorting to a common alternate method for thread cutting, she reached for a candle to use its flame to burn off a section of yarn, the alcohol-infused cloth caught on fire and Charles the Bad, tightly swaddled in the burning linen, was unable to escape, he suffered horrific burns all over his body, and lingered for two weeks in extreme agony, before death finally released him from his suffering. Number 1. The King Who Murdered His Sister Wife Cousin Egypt's Ptolemaic dynasty was probably history's most dysfunctional and perverse ruling family, in which intrafamilial murder and incest were so common that their absence from a reign was more shocking than their practice. Perhaps none of the Ptolemies illustrates how tangled things had gotten after generations of incest than Ptolemy XI, Alexander II, who ruled the kingdom for a few days in 80 BC. His uncle Ptolemy IX Lathrios had died in 80 BC, leaving the throne to his daughter Cleopatra Bernice, who briefly reigned alone as Bernice III. The Roman dictator Sulla however wanted a more pliant ruler, so he sent a young Ptolemy XI to Egypt, there, the new arrival married Bernice III, his cousin as well as his half-sister, and ruled jointly with her, the joint rule would last only a few weeks, before Berenice's brother-husband did her in.